In this video, we talk about data binding. Data binding is a system in WPF that allows you to create a connection between the user interface and the underlying data. This connection ensures that the changes made in the data are automatically reflected in the user interface and vice versa. This is useful because it helps to keep the user interface and the data in sync, which can make it easier to create and maintain complex applications. Let's go to Visual Studio and explore the basics of data binding and see how we can use data binding in WPF projects. So what I have here in Visual Studio is a WPF project setup. Let's start by examining what we have defined in the UI here. So I have a grid split in half by defining two columns here. The column on the left contains some labels as well as the column on the right. So I'll be simply using this UI to demonstrate data binding. Let's go to the main window.cs file. Now to fully understand data binding, we need to understand the features that WPF provides for us to be able to implement data binding. And one of the most noted features is the data context. Now the data context is simply a property that we can use to specify the source of the data when we are trying to perform data binding. Now every element or every class in WPF that inherits from the framework element contains a property called the data context. So what we can do here is we can get the instance of this window by using the this keyword. Then we can examine the property here. So we have the data context property here. If I navigate to the definition of this property, we can see it's simply an object and it's defined in the framework element class. So as long as a class inherits from this class, it contains that property. So this property allows us to specify the source of the data within a given context. So in this case, this will be within the context of the window. Now, if we go to the main window.xaml file here, we have a grid and the grid contains the name, my grid. So we can access the reference of that grid through the name. So I'll say my grid, and we can also see it contains the data context property. So we use this property to set the object, which will be the default source of the data during data binding. So what I'll do is I'll create a class that we're going to use to perform the data binding. So right here in the data bindings basics namespace, I'll define a class and I'll call this class person. And this class is going to contain some properties. The first one will be of the type string. And I'll simply give it a property name of name. Simply copy. The other property will be email, then address. And finally, number, like a phone number. I'll set this to an integer and I'll set it to a nullable type. Okay, so I'm going to add a constructor. So C, T, O, R, then I'll click tab twice. Then we have the constructor defined. Okay, so there we have it. So we have the person class. So what I'll do here is I'm going to create an instance of the person class right within the main Windows constructor. So I'll say person, and I'll say underscore person is equals to a new instance of the person class. Now I'm going to set the properties. So starting with the name, so I say name is equal to Jamie. Then I'll set the email at one, two, three. Net. So I'll do the same for the address, 
I'll set it to Wall Street. And finally, the number. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. All right, so we have an instance of the percent class. So how do we perform data binding to the UI here to display the details that we have in the object here? So we can do this by simply specifying the data context on the window and we can access it using the this keyword. So this window, then we set the data context object to this instance of person. So simply copy. So by doing that, we now have access to the person's data right here in the main window. So the data context of this window here is set to person. So how is that possible? Well, this window here and this window here are actually one class. Why is that? Because this is defined as a partial class. Now a partial class is simply a class split into two files. So one part of the class is defined in C sharp code here and the other is defined in XML. So when compiling this application, this XML code is actually going to be turned into C sharp code. So we're actually within the same class. So the data context object is available here. So here I have the labels on the right side. So I'm going to get rid of the name here. So instead of using name, I'm going to use a binding. So I'll simply use the binding attribute. So I'll say binding. Then I'm just going to bind it to a property. And this property is the name property here. So I'll copy this. And I'll paste it here. So we have name. I'll do the same for the address. So I'll say binding. The same for the email. And the same for the number. All right. So now here we see we do not have data because this will be resolved at runtime. So let's go ahead and run the application. All right. And there we have it. So we have the data displayed here. So we have Jamie, Wall Street, and the email as well. So this data is coming from an object that we have defined in the code, and we are able to see it in the UI. All right, so I'll go ahead and close this. Now, we can also specify the mode of the binding. So here on the mode, we can either set it to one-time, one-way, two-way binding. So by default, the mode is set to a two-way binding, which means if we had to make the changes in the UI, then those changes would reflect in the code behind, in the object that we created. Now the label control is a read-only control, which means we can't actually edit the data here. So what I'll do is I'll simply change this to a text box. And I'll change that to the text property. So I'll do the same for the rest. All right, so there we have it. So we have some text blocks here. So what I'll do is I'll run the application. We have an error, so I'll simply get rid of this comma here. Then we run the application again. All right, so the application is up and running and we can see the text boxes defined here. So we can actually edit the data. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to space these out by changing the margin. So I'll change this to 80. All right, so that's it. So to allow some space. Okay, then what I'm going to do for the text boxes is I'm going to define 
a height. In this case, I'll define it to 25 for each. All right, just to allow some space. And I'll also define the width to 100 pixels. All right, so there we have it. Let's run the application. Okay, so here we can see that we have the names and this is the data that we defined in the object that we created. So I can actually make changes here and those changes would reflect in the object. So how do we see those changes reflect? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a button here. So when we click the button, we're going to get the object and display it inside the message box to see if the changes will be made. So I'll close this, then I'll add a button. So I'll set the content property of the button to show. Then I'm going to add a click event handler. So I'll say click, then add an event handler. All right, so we have a click event handler. So here I'll go to the main window. Then we can see we have a handler here. So what I'll do is I'll simply say, message box, then show, then here we can specify the text that we want to show. So what I'll simply do is I'm going to use string interpolation. So I'm going to add a dollar sign at the beginning, curly braces, so I'll simply say show the person's name. Now we can't access this object because it's defined within the constructor, which means we can only define it, we can only access it if we are calling a method from within here. So what I'm going to do is I'll get this object and make it a global object by placing it at the class level. Okay, so we have person available here. So I'll simply say person then we can get the name. So this time I'm only going to display the name, nothing else. All right, so let's go ahead and run the application. Now here we mentioned that by default, the binding mode is set to two-way binding, which means if I change the name here, the name in the object, which is the person object, will also be changed. So this time let's try Mike, and here's my button, sorry, I minimized. So we have Mike, so if I show, we see that the name is Mike. Now, we're getting this name from the person object. If I say, okay, then let me change it to Dave, and we see it's changed to Dave. All right, so let's go ahead and close. All right, so there we have it. So what we can do is, we can also set the mode to one way. So I'll simply say mode, then set it to one way. So I'll copy this. All right, so I'll go ahead and run the application. And here, I'll expand this to expose the button. So if I change the name from Jamie to Mike and try to show, we see it still shows Jamie. That's because this data wasn't reflected or wasn't synchronized the other way. So that's one way binding demonstrated. So I'll go ahead and close this. And we can see that there are also other types of bindings like one-time binding. So this type of binding is used when you're trying to initialize the UI. So it only happens once. So I'll get rid of that. So what I'm going to demonstrate now is the ability to bind between elements. For instance, I can bind between a text box and a label. So I can exchange information between these two elements. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add 
a rectangle to the UI. So I'll simply say rectangle. So I'll set the height to a hundred and the width to a hundred. Then I'll set the fill to a shade of orange. All right, so we have a rectangle here. So what I'll do is I'll simply move it downwards then. Then I'll change this button to a checkbox. So I'll set its content property to, just set it to button. All right, so that we can see we have something there. And I'll move it further to the right. So I'll set the margin to 200. Okay, so what I'll be doing is I'll be binding a property from this to this here. So what I'm going to do is I'll give this a name. So I'll simply say name, then I'll say C box. So that's its name. Now I'm going to bind it to the visibility property. So I'll say visibility. Now we can see that the visibility property is defined as an enum. So we have collapse, hidden, and visible. So I'll try to bind it to the checked property of this checkbox. Is checked. If I set this to true, by clicking this, if I set this to true, I would like to bind it to the visibility. So I would like this to disappear or appear. Now the thing is that this is defined as an enum and this is defined as a boolean. So these properties are not compatible. WPF provides a way to solve this problem where we're trying to bind two incompatible types. And this is by using value converters. So here, if I specify a binding, so I'll say binding, then I'll specify the source of the binding. This time I'm going to use the element name. So I'll say C box. So by doing so, we are overriding the default source, which is the data context source. This time we are getting this from this box element here because we specified the name. So what I'm going to do now is I can specify the path. So this time I'm going to specify the path as the is checked property. So I'll say is checked. All right. Now, if we try to run the application, this won't work. Why? Because this is a boolean and the visibility is an enum type. So we need to use what is called a value converter. And right here in the binding, we can specify a converter. So we can specify a converter that converts a boolean into visibility. So to do that, right here in the XAML, I'm going to declare a resource. So in the window, I'm going to say window, then resources, Then within this window resource, I'm going to declare a converter. And this is the visibility to Boolean converter. So here we have it, Boolean to visibility converter. So this is already defined in .NET. So we don't really need to define our own converter. So I'll specify a key. And this key is going to be my converter. All right, so we have a Boolean to visibility converter and we gave it a name, a key. So here in the binding, we can now specify that converter. So I'll simply say my, in fact, what I'll do is I'll simply copy this and paste it here. Probably there's an exception. So. When binding to the converter, we need to specify a static resource. So in this case, we need to 
specify that and then we define the converter all right and let's go ahead and run the application okay i'm going to resize all right so we have the button here and right now we haven't clicked it so the visibility is set to hidden why that's because it's binding to this buttons is checked property so if i click we see it appear if i click it disappears so this is a binding happening all right so that's it for the basics of data binding in wpf remember to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel if you find this content useful i'll see you in the next one